I was once told by someone who works in football that over half of all transfers will end up being failures and that clubs have just got to learn to accept that fact. Even all-time greats like Sir Alex at Manchester United had a roughly equal ratio of hits and misses. For every Roy Keane, there was an Eric Jemba Jemba. For every Cristiano Ronaldo, a Bebe. And for every Peter Schmeichel, a Massimo Taibi. Subsequent data-driven analysis, analysing thousands of transfers, puts the number that could be deemed successful at around 40%. Brentford and Brighton fans might think that seems drastically low, whilst Everton fans might be thinking it unrealistically high, but apparently that's the average. In today's video, I wanted to focus solely on deals that weren't just successful, but were mind-boggling bargains that still seem hard to believe. Signings like Henrik Larsson, who cost Celtic just £650,000 before proceeding to score 242 goals in 313 games for the club, or Colo Torre, who set Arsenal back just a nominal £150,000, but went on to play more than 300 games for the Gunners, becoming one of the best centre-backs in the Premier League, and eventually departing for almost 100 times what he had cost them in a £14 million move to Manchester City. I have previously made a video about the best signing in world football every year, from 1995 to 2020, but I got lots of comments like this, so the focus this time around is purely on stupidly cheap bargains. Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, was a great signing by Manchester United and proved to be a real bargain, but £12.24 million was still a pretty hefty fee for a teenager back in 2003. The same goes for the likes of Frank Lampard, Thierry Henry, and Michael Ballack. Heck, you could easily argue that Gianluigi Buffon still ended up being a bargain despite Juventus paying a massive world record-breaking fee for a goalkeeper, of 52 million euros all the way back in 2001, but it's not those kinds of deals that we're interested in. I'm not including free transfers or academy signings, because it is more interesting without them, so without further ado, who only once commanded a transfer fee at all when he signed for Benfica, and he didn't end up being too much of a bargain for them, here is the biggest bargain signing in world football every season over the last 20 years. 2002-03, Danny Alves. Honourable mentions go to Italy right-back Massimo Oddo, who joined Lazio for 1.5 million euros in the summer of 2002, registered almost 175 appearances for them, and was sold on for more than 10 million euros. Spanish goalkeeper Pepe Reina signed that summer for just 750,000 euros by Villarreal, where he became one of the best goalkeepers in Spain, before being sold on for 9.8 million euros to Liverpool. Marcus Senna signed for £600,000 also by Villarreal, where he went on to play 360 games, and Stuart Elliott, who was signed by Hull City, and no, that is not the only reason why I'm mentioning him, for £230,000, where he proceeded to become the highest scorer in English League football in the 2004-05 season, from the left flank no less, despite missing 10 games out injured. All are eclipsed, well and truly though, by Sevilla's January 2003 signing of Dani Alves from Bahia in Brazil for a fee of just €550,000, or €1.05 million Euros, if you include his loan fee as well. Age 19 at the time and uncapped by Brazil at youth team level, Alves spent five and a half years in Seville, twice winning the UEFA Cup, making the UEFA Team of the Year, and becoming a mainstay in the Brazilian national team. In 2006, Alves reportedly agreed a deal to sign for Liverpool, but the Reds refused to meet Sevilla's £6 million asking price. Two years later, when Alves did leave the club, it was in a move to Barcelona for an initial £23 million, plus £7 million in future add-ons. It made Alves the world's most expensive right-back at the time, though he still turned out to be a brilliant signing, though perhaps not quite as much of a bargain this time around, so to speak. As much as I love Stuart Elliott, Alves has got to get us started. 2003-04. Jens Lehmann. 
Cristiano Ronaldo was the best signing of the 2003-04 season, which was a particularly busy and hectic one for Europe's elite, though I have already explained in the introduction why he was still too expensive to feature. Cesc Fabregas, somewhat similarly, joined Arsenal for just 3.2 million euros that season, but he was an academy player at the time who hadn't yet played for Barcelona, and therefore also cannot feature. Gael Cliche is deserving of an extremely honourable mention, signed that summer by Arsenal for just £250,000, where he made almost 300 appearances, made the Premier League team of the season, and was sold for roughly 30 times as much to Manchester City, but it is another bargain basement Arsenal signing that takes top spot. Jens Lehmann was already a German international, capped more than 10 times, when Arsenal signed him for just £1.5 million from Borussia Dortmund in the summer of 2003. The fact that Lehmann was already 33 most likely played a part in the fee being so low, but Arsenal gambled on his best year still being ahead of him, and that assessment proved to be a very shrewd one. Despite being given the unenviable task of replacing David Seaman, Lehman was an instant success, playing every single minute in the Premier League as Arsenal went invincible during his debut campaign. In total, Lehman played 199 games for Arsenal, winning the UEFA Goalkeeper of the Year award in 2006, before returning briefly in the 2010-11 season to take him up to 200 appearances for the Gunners. 2004-05, Robin Van Persie. I very nearly went for back-to-back -back goalkeepers courtesy of Petr Cech, who proved to be an outrageous bargain for Chelsea at just £7 million, but strange as this may sound, particularly to younger viewers, that wasn't actually that cheap for a goalkeeper back in 2004, and it is just a little bit too steep to earn Cech an inclusion. Instead, we get back-to-back -back Arsenal signings, since the Gunners paid a fee of just £2.75 million to bring Robin Van Persie to the Premier League from Feyenoord in the summer of 2004, in what turned out to be an inspired piece of business. Initially a backup to Thierry Henry, and later played fairly often on the left flank, Van Persie went on to score 132 goals and made 58 assists in 278 games for Arsenal, winning the Premier League Golden Boot in his final season, in which he scored 37 goals in all competitions, before being controversially sold for £24 million to Manchester United. An honourable mention goes to Everton legend and shameless Qatari stooge Tim Cahill, who was signed by the Toffees for just £1.5 million that season. 2005-06, Edwin van der Sar. It was very nearly a hat-trick of Arsenal signings, reiterating the remarkable work that the Gunners did in the transfer market for many years on a relatively modest budget, thanks to Emmanuel Adebayor, who Arsenal signed for £3 million from Monaco in January 2006. Adebayor went on to score 62 goals in 142 games for Arsenal, before being sold for £25 million to Manchester City, where he famously refused to celebrate after scoring against his former club. Manchester United made a couple of sensational signings in January 2006, namely Patrice Evra and Nemanja Vidic, but at £5.5 million and £7 million respectively, they are overlooked in favour of longtime teammate Edwin van der Sar. Our second keeper and our second Dutchman out of only four inclusions, unlike some players in this video who were little known at the time, but turned out to be bargains, van der Sar always seemed like a steal. Ten years after winning the Champions League at Ajax, Van der Sar joined Manchester United from Fulham for a fee of just £2 million. The Dutchman was 34 at the time, soon to turn 35, but he still went on to spend six seasons as Manchester United's number one, becoming the club's first world-class goalkeeper since Peter Schmeichel's departure six years earlier. Following four Premier League titles and a Champions League, Van der Sar was so good that Alex Ferguson tried to convince him not to retire, even at the age of 40, but to no avail. 2006-07, Joe Hart. The two greatest left-backs of the previous generation, namely Marcelo and Ashley Cole, were both signed for bargain fees in the 2006-07 season. 
Marcelo set Real Madrid back just 6.5 million euros when he arrived from Fluminense, meanwhile Chelsea only paid 5 million pounds, plus the services of William Gallas, to take Ashley Cole from Arsenal. Both were better signings, and indeed better players, than Joe Hart, but it's ludicrous bargains that we are most interested in, and Hart fits that bill better than just about anyone else. Following just a single season as Shrewsbury Town's number one in League Two, age 19, Hart was signed by a pre-UAE era Manchester City, and the fee was reported at the time as having been between £600,000 to £1.5 million subject to add-ons, but it later transpired that it was just £100,000. Hart went on to play 348 games for Man City, winning a joint record four Premier League Golden Gloves, tied with Petr Cech, and even after being shunned by Pep Guardiola and suffering a fairly steep decline, he was still sold for 35 times more than they paid for him in a £3.5 million move to Burnley. 2007-08, Gareth Bale. Our most expensive signing yet, Gareth Bale was signed by Tottenham for an initial £5 million, rising to £10 million subject to add-ons. Not only did Tottenham reportedly not end up paying the full £10 million price tag, maybe there were some add-ons relating to trophies there, they managed to remove his sell-on clause by selling goalkeeper Tommy Forecast to Southampton, who never even played for the Saints. That meant that after Bale became a superstar, was named Premier League Player of the Season, and was sold for a world record shattering £86 million to Real Madrid, Tottenham didn't have to pass on a penny to Southampton. That gives Bale the edge over the likes of David Luiz, signed that summer for just €1.5 million Euros by Benfica, and Leighton Baines, who Everton bought for only £6 million. Louise was later sold for €25 million Euros to Chelsea, whilst Baines went on to make 420 appearances at Goodison Park, becoming one of the finest left-backs of the Premier League era. 2008-09, Seamus Coleman. There were a plethora of outstanding bargains in the 2008-09 season, from the £6 million that Manchester City paid for Vincent Company to the £6.45 million that they spent on Pablo Zabaleta, and the £5 million fee that Barcelona paid to re-sign Gerard Piquet from Manchester United. All, arguably, were better signings than Seamus Coleman, given what they went on to win at their new clubs, but none can compare on the bargain front. Coleman set Everton back just £60,000, yes, 60, well, I suppose 60000, as they saw off competition from the likes of Ipswich Town, Birmingham City, and Celtic to bring the Irishman to Merseyside. An Irish under 21 international at the time, Coleman had played just 62 games for Sligo Rovers, and aged 34, he has now played more than 400 games for the Toffees, and is still a regular starter and a new boss, Sean Deitch. 2009-10, Mats Hummels. Another season jam-packed full of bargains, Everton signing Sylvan Distan for £5 million, Carl Walker to Tottenham for £4.5 million, Inter Milan picking up Lucio for just €7 million, Rajanine Golan joining Cagliari for €1.3 million, Euros, and Marco Royce's €1 million Euro move to Borussia Mönchengladbach, all earn very honourable mentions, but all, equally, are just pipped to the post by Mats Hummels. Starved of game time at Bayern Munich, where he only ever made two appearances after coming through the club's youth ranks, Borussia Dortmund parted with just €4 million Euros in order to sign Hummels following a brief spell on loan. At the time, Dortmund weren't even competing in Europe, and Bayern likely didn't view them or Hummels, as posing any kind of a threat. A year later, Hummels was arguably the best centre-back in the Bundesliga, a regular starter for Germany, and Dortmund won the first of two back-to-back -back Bundesliga titles. Hummels went on to rack up over 300 appearances at the Westfalen Stadion, before being sold back to Bayern for a fee of €38 million. Euros. Hummels has been back at Dortmund since 2019, and he now ranks second in the club's all-time appearance charts. 2010-11, Rafael Leao. 
Robert Lewandowski. The most difficult season to pick a single signing from in this entire video. I was really tempted to go with Andrea Barzagli, who Juventus signed for €300,000 in January 2011, and he went on to form one-third of a world-class back three for the next eight seasons. Shinji Kagawa is another outstanding candidate, signed for a modest fee of €350,000 by Borussia Dortmund, where he made the Bundesliga team of the season twice in only 18 months, before being sold for a potential £17 million to Manchester United. And lastly, Olivier Giroud, who was signed by Montpellier for €2 million, Euros, scored 39 goals in 85 games, inspiring them to their first and still their only ever league gun title, before being sold for €12.4 million Euros to Arsenal. Amidst some admittedly fierce competition though, I still can't look beyond Robert Lewandowski. Brought to Borussia Dortmund that season, just like Shinji Kagawa and Mats Hummels the previous season, for a fee of 4.5 million euros, after Blackburn Rovers and Genoa had come within inches of signing him, Robert Lewandowski took a season to get up to speed with the Bundesliga, before becoming one of the most lethal centre forwards on the planet. Maybe Barzagli and Kagawa would be more worthy inclusions, given that they were so much cheaper than him, but it was the fact that Lewandowski's goals fired Dortmund to two Bundesliga titles that ultimately swung it for me. 2011-12, Raphael Varane. I was slightly less spoilt for choice in the 2011-12 season, it must be said, in which two of the strongest candidates were both centre-backs, namely Gary Cahill and Raphael Varane. Cahill set Chelsea back just £7 million when he arrived in January 2012 from Bolton Wanderers, basically sealing Bolton's relegation, but giving Chelsea a rock-solid centre-back partnership for most of the next decade. Varane was a little bit more expensive than Cahill, signed by Real Madrid for £8.7 million from Len, but I think that it is fairly uncontroversial to say that he is a better player who had an even greater contribution. Varane went on to play 360 games for Real Madrid, winning the Champions League four times and making the FIFA Pro World Eleven in 2018, before he was allowed to join Manchester United for a fee of £34 million. Not bad business overall then. 2012-13. Jamie Vardy. There were perhaps more candidates for the 2012-13 season than there were for any other individual campaign, but how could I possibly pick anyone other than Jamie Vardy? Ironically, given that he was a non-league player at the time, when Leicester City paid £1 million for Jamie Vardy, plus a potential £700,000 in future add-ons, which was a record fee for a non-league player at the time, it was scrutinised as being another Games Gone moment. That's certainly not how it has turned out. It took Vardy a season to adjust to the championship before tearing it apart, and likewise in the Premier League. But his 24 goals in 36 games were integral to Leicester winning a most unlikely Premier League title, and for him to have become the 14th highest scorer of the Premier League era, when he was still playing non-league football at the age of 25, is nothing short of remarkable. Honourable mentions go to Swansea City signing Michu, Barcelona's recruitment of Jordi Alba, Everton addition John Stones, Tottenham signing Hugo Lloris, Roma's signing of Marquinhos, and perhaps most notably of all, Chelsea signing Cesar Azpilicueta for just £7 million, who has since played over 500 games for the club, becoming club captain and winning it all. 2013-14, Riyad Mahrez. It's notable how many club signings feature back-to-back -back in this video, or very nearly do, given that any signing by any club in all of world football is eligible for every season, and it perhaps says something about how successful scouting and recruitment cycles work. Six months after signing Jamie Vardy, Leicester City signed Riyad Mahrez for less than half the price. Mahrez set the Foxes back a mere £450,000 in January 2014, when he arrived from second-tier French outfit Le Havre, winning promotion from the Championship in his debut half-campaign, and a Premier League title in his third. 
Following four and a half seasons at the King Power Stadium, Mares was sold for £60 million to Manchester City, making him the most expensive African international of all time. Back in France, well, sort of, during the same season, Monaco signed Anthony Martial for just €5 million, Euros, and two years later they sold him for a potential £58 million, so that earns him an honourable mention. 2014-15, Wilfred Zaha. There are several bigger names, perhaps, that I could have featured for the 2014-15 season, particularly from England, whether that be Hull City's joint signing of Andy Robertson and Harry Maguire, Tottenham bringing in Deli Alley from MK Dons, who you may forget, but was actually really good for a few years, or Bournemouth's recruitment of Callum Wilson that fired them to the Premier League. But on a pure pound to impact basis, Wilfred Zaha trumps them all. A graduate of the Crystal Palace youth ranks, the Eagles sold Zaha to Manchester United for between 10 to 15 million pounds in January 2013 and brought him back for between 3 to 6 million pounds in February 2015. It is a signing which, up to this point at least, has basically secured Palace's Premier League status season after season, and no one has played more games or scored more goals for the club in the Premier League. 2015-16, Angolo Kante. Real Madrid aren't exactly renowned for their frugality, but they signed Marco Asensio for just €3.9 million Euros from Mallorca in the 2015-16 season, who has now played more games for the club than either Ferenc Puskas or Luis Figo, which is surely deserving of an honourable mention. Meanwhile, Bayern Munich signed Joshua Kimmich for just €7 million Euros that season, and Hoffenheim paid a mere €2.2 million Euros for Joe Linton, who they later sold for €14 million to Newcastle. All three are overlooked, though, in favour of Angolo Kante, our third Leicester City signing in only four seasons, who joined the Foxes in the summer of 2015 for a £5.6 million fee from Cannes. Kante spent just a single season at Leicester, where he was tasked with replacing Esteban Cambiasso, but during that season he was their single most important player, as they won the most unlikely of Premier League titles, and the following summer... He was sold for £32 million to Chelsea. 2016-17 Nick Pope The best signing of the 2016-17 season was surely Ousmane Dembele, signed by Borussia Dortmund for €15 million Euros and sold 12 months later for a potential €145 million Euros to Barcelona. But I fear that €15 million Euros is still just a little bit too steep for us at least compared to the competition. Manchester City paid £1.7 million for Alexander Zinchenko that season, who played 128 games for them and won 10 trophies, before being sold for over £30 million to Arsenal, and Dominic Calvert-Lewin joined Everton for just £1.5 million. But I am inclined to go with Nick Pope, who joined Burnley for £1.1 million from Charlton Athletic, where he played 155 games and had four sensational seasons before joining Newcastle United for £10 million last summer. 2017-18, Andy Robertson. It was a tough decision for the 2017-18 season, primarily between Borussia Dortmund's £8 million signing of Jadon Sancho, although, come to think of it, he wouldn't have been eligible because he'd never played for Man City and would be an academy player. So, not that tough, actually. And Liverpool's deal to sign Andy Robertson for the exact same fee. Sancho had three outstanding seasons at Dortmund, becoming one of the most productive wide players in Europe before being sold for £73 million to Manchester United. Not that any of that's relevant because, as we just realised, he could never have featured at all. Andy Robertson, meanwhile, hasn't yet and will never be sold for such a blockbuster fee, but that's because he is still starring for Liverpool, where he has been one of the best left-backs in the world for a number of years. I have it on good authority that Robertson actually ended up costing Liverpool £12 million, subject to add-ons, making him our most expensive signing yet, 
but he still proved to be phenomenal value and a phenomenal bargain, fully deserving of an inclusion. Especially when you look at some of the fees paid for comparable fullbacks over recent years. 2018-19, Emi Buendia. Recent inclusions have taken a decidedly England-based turn, and I am open to accusations of English centrism, if credible arguments can be made in favour of other players, which I am more than sure that they could. It should be said, it is inevitable that I will miss plenty of signings, since despite spending an entire Sunday afternoon and late evening devoted to researching this topic, it is impossible to analyse every single transfer that has happened over the last 20 years. Outside of England, Tyler Adams ought to get a look in for the 2018-19 season, signed by RB Leipzig from New York Red Bulls in January 2019 for just $3 million. That must have been a really tough negotiation, before joining Leeds United three and a half years later for £20 million. Back in England, Leicester City signed Johnny Evans for £3.5 million, João Moutinho joined Wolves for just £5 million, Aston Villa got their hands on John McGinn for a fee of £3 million, and Brentford forked out £2.7 million to sign side Ben Rama, who was fantastic in the championship, before joining West Ham United in a deal worth a potential £30 million. The biggest bargain of the lot, though, I think, is Emi Buendia, who was signed by Norwich City in the championship for a fee of £1.6 million from Getafe, spent three seasons in Norfolk, the last of which was among the finest individual seasons anyone has ever had in the championship, inspiring the Canaries to the title and therefore promotion, and then he was sold for between £33 to £38 million, subject to add-ons to Aston Villa. 2019-20, Gabriel Martinelli. Seeing off Eintracht Frankfurt paying €6 million Euros for Luka Jovic before selling him five minutes later, for 63 million euros to Real Madrid, which, you know, wasn't bad business, is Arsenal's signing of Gabriel Martinelli. Brought to the Emirates from the fourth tier of Brazilian football, having impressed in the prestigious Campeonato Paulista, he set the Gunners back just six million pounds. An instant success, only a nasty knee cartilage injury, managed to thwart his progress, but this season, we've seen what he is really capable of. Still only 21, Martinelli is Arsenal's top scorer as they lead the Premier League table with 13 goals and he is now probably worth something like £100 million, if not even more than that. 2020-21, Evan Ferguson. Not an academy signing before any of you say it and I know that there was one or two of you thinking it because he had already played four games in Ireland for Bohemians there is no definitive figure as to how much Evan Ferguson cost Brighton, but it seems certain that it was less than £1 million, and plausible that it was less than 100000 That is remarkable business, given that Liverpool were also determined to sign him, but Ferguson turned them down, and the player that he already looks to be now, still aged only 18. Such a complete centre forward, without wanting to get too carried away, I think that Ferguson could become the Premier League's all-time record goalscorer, win 15 Ballon d'Ors, and bring about a United Ireland. I am exaggerating for comic effect there, of course, but I do think that he's very good, and he features ahead of fellow 2020-21 Brighton signing, Moises Caicedo, who is even better but set Brighton back, a much heftier, though still absolute bargain, £4 million. 2021-22, Kaoru Mitoma. Well, it is descending into a bit of a Brighton love-in at this stage, but the Seagulls' recruitment in recent years has been awe-inspiring, and now seems like as good of a time as any to plug the fact that I recently made a whole video explaining how and why Brighton's recruitment is so good. Among the best of the bunch in terms of the club's signings has been Kaoru Mitoma, who was brought to the Amex from Japanese outfit Kawasaki Frontale for a fee of £2.5 million in August of 2021. 
A late bloomer who has a university degree and wrote his thesis on dribbling, would you believe it? Mitoma spent his first season at Brighton, so last season, on loan at their sister club, Union saint Gilloir in Belgium. This season, however, he has grown to become one of the key men in their first team, and one of the most technically proficient and aesthetically impressive players in the Premier League. An absolute bargain of a signing, and knowing Brighton, if they were to sell him now, it would probably be for about £200 million. 2022-23. Quicha Garasvelia. I very nearly went with Enzo Fernandez for this season, who joined Benfica last summer for an initial €10 million, Euros, plus €8 million Euros in potential future add-ons, and was sold just six months later, by that stage having won the World Cup, for 121 million euros, which is a world record fee for a central midfielder. I would be happy for him to have taken the crown, but in the end, I went for Quicha Garasvelia, who looks set to have a far greater impact than just making his employers a shed load of cash over a remarkably short period of time. Starring for Ruben Kazan 12 months ago, when Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Gvarasvelia, like many foreign players, left Russia in light of that escalation, joining Dinamo Batumi in his native Georgia. Following 8 goals in only 11 games, Batumi were delighted to receive a 10 to 12 million euro windfall as Gvarasvelia was swiftly signed by Napoli. That now looks like one of the deals of the decade, as Guarasvelia tears apart Syria defences for fun in a Napoli side set to run away with this season's Scudetto. I would love to see Napoli keep hold of their most prized assets like Guarasvelia and Victor Osimhen this summer, but if they are to sell any, it is rumoured that they will demand a fee of £140 million for Guarasvelia. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. I'm sure you have many. And also, um, you know, why not subscribe and turn on notifications, both for this channel and for my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens now, along with two incredible videos for you to watch should you be interested. Uh, you can also find me on either Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.